Hi there, this is Robin Norgren, and I'm your host for Montessori Creativity and the Meaning of Life. I'd like to start um, our podcast today with some words from White Hot Truth by Daniel Laporte. Around the same time, I was starting to get the drift that, hey, not all spiritual teachers were talking their meta- walking their meta talk. I had dinner with an ordained monk to discuss a global meditation campaign, and he was so rude to the waiter that I left a 50% tip as an apology. I dragged a friend to a lecture on transcending the ego, a night with a very popular American guru-type guy. It was only a few weeks after the 9-11 terrorist attacks in the U.S., and one audience member, after standing in the long queue for questions— asked the expert how to deal with the trauma from recent events. Monsieur No Ego, in his designer loafers, scoffed at him from the stage. He said, I've come to talk about the ego, not events in the media. Okay. The discomfort in the room was supersized. The man who asked the question stuttered, Well, I thought it was relevant, and then slunk back to his seat. My friend and I looked at each other, aghast. I did my best, WTF was that face. And then she mouthed to me, what an asshole. Naturally, that triggered an illegal giggle fit, and we had to do the walk of shame out of the ballroom, giggling all the way. Because I was working as, as a publicist in the personal growth scene, I heard my fair share of stories about naughty commune leaders and cranky curtain singers and authors with best-selling relationship advice books who were embroiled in bitter divorces. Culturally, we're not as surprised when a politician is busted for having extramarital affairs. But when you find out that the wispy angel channeler guy is having orgies, it's a little more jarring and a lot more entertaining. I think back on my gullibility of those days with fondness. Imagine... I thought that because their workshops are sold out or because they've studied in India, that the experts' motives match their messages. It turns out that if you've got a good publicist, you can sell almost anything. Daniel Oldier, in his book Desire, The Tantric Path to Awakening, says, We want a path that would not be opposed to our life, a life that would not be opposed to our path. We want to attain a plentitude without denying life's marvelous effervescence. We want a life and moving joy that would bring us to a larger, more all-encompassing experience of reality. My New Year's resolution a few years back was to be way mo bad. My version of the good kind of bad. Smoke more, drink more, eat more red meat, really rare. What really turned on me was the idea of deleting everything in my inbox. Nasty girl hitting delete. Clearly nasty is a relative term. I started coming across spiritual characters who had stepped out of bounds in life-affirming ways. Thomas Merton, a much-respected American Trappist monk, fell in love with a nurse who was tending to him. I am humbled and confused by my weakness, my vulnerability, my passion, he wrote of their connection. After ending the relationship, he recommended himself to, the, to his vows. I read about nuns who left the convent for romantic love. I was in my 12th year of vegetarianism when I heard that the Dalai Lama, a lifelong vegetarian, had started eating beef at his doctor's insistence, made me want a cheeseburger. A good friend of mine was on a retreat with a Zen Roshi who had just given a genius teaching on the purity of the mind when she caught him smoking behind the temple during a break. Unfazed, he shrugged, took another drag, and said, You can't take any of this too seriously, and exhaled a waft of smoke. Now there's a workshop takeaway. I was longing for another way to aspire, a fuller way to worship. I wanted to consume life, consciously but guilt-free. I wanted to express myself, considerately, with, but without hesitation. I wanted a purity of soul that wasn't puritanical. I wanted an intensity of intention to go deep and at the same time lighten up.
Some words from Steel Like an Artist by Austin Klingon. I'm going to start with a quote by John Cleese. We don't know where we get our ideas from. What we do know is that we do not get them from our laptops. Step away from the screen. My favorite cartoonist, Linda Berry, has this saying, In the digital age, don't forget to use your, digit your digits. Your hands are the original digital devices. Use them. While I love my computer, I think computers have robbed us of the feeling that we're actually making things. Instead, we're just typing keys and clicking mouse buttons. This is why so-called knowledge work seems so abstract. The artist Stanley Donwood, who's made all the album artwork for the band Radiohead, says computers are alienating because they put a sheet of glass between you and whatever is happening. You never really get to touch anything that you're doing unless you print it out, Donwood says. Just watch someone at their computer. They're so still, so immobile. You don't need a scientific study, of which there are a few, to tell you that sitting in front of a computer all day is killing you and killing your work. We need to move to feel like we're making something with our bodies, not just our heads. Work that only comes from the head isn't any good. Watch a great musician play a show. Watch a great leader give a speech. You'll see what I mean. You need to find a way to bring your body into your work. Our nerves aren't a one-way street. Our bodies can tell our brains as much as our brains can tell our bodies. You know that phrase, going through the motions? That's what's so great about creative work. If we just start going through the motions, if we strum a guitar, or shuffle sticky notes around a conference table, or start kneading clay, the motion kickstarts our brain into something. When I was in creative writing workshops in college, everything we did had to be double-spaced and in Times Roman f New Roman font. And my stuff was just terrible. Writing ceased to be any fun for me. The poet Kay Ryan says, in the old days before creative writing programs, a workshop was a place, often a basement, where you sawed or hammered, drilled, or planed something. The, bri the writer Brian Kitley says, he tries to make his workshops true to the original sense of the word, a light, airy room full of tools and raw materials where most of the work is hands-on. It wasn't until I started bringing analog tools back into my process that making things became fun again and my work started to improve. For my first book, Newspaper Blackout, I tried to make the process as hands-on as possible. Every poem in that book was made with a newspaper article and a permanent marker. The process engaged most of my senses. The feel of newsprint in my hands, the sight of words disappearing under my lines, the faint squeak of the marker, the marker tip, the smell of the marker fumes. There was a kind of magic happening. When I was making the poems, it didn't feel like work. It felt like joy. The computer is really good for editing your ideas, and it's really good for getting your ideas ready for publishing out in the world, but it's not really good for generating ideas. There are too many opportunities to hit the delete key. The computer brings out the uptight perfectionist in us. We start editing ideas before we have them. The cartoonist Tom Gauld says he stays away from the computer until he's done most of the thinking for his strips because once the computer is involved, things are on an inevitable path to being finished, whereas in my sketchbook, the possibilities are endless. From the book Walking on Water, by Lengo. Kairos, real time, God's time. That time which breaks through Kronos with a shock of joy. That time we do not recognize while we are experiencing it, but only afterwards, because Kairos has nothing to do with chronological time. 
In Kairos, we are completely unselfconscious and yet paradoxically far more real than we can ever be when we are constantly checking out our watches for chronological time. The saint in contemplation, lost, parentheses, discovered, to self in the mind of God, is in Kairos. The artist at work is in Kairos. The child at play, totally thrown outside himself in the game, be it building a sandcastle or making a daisy chain, is in Kairos. In Kairos, we become what we are called to be as human beings, co-creators with God, touching on the wonder of creation. This calling should not be limited to artists or saints, but it is a fearful calling, mana, taboo. It can destroy as well as bring into being. In the play Our Town, after Emily has died in childbirth, Thornton Wilder has her ask the stage manager if she can return home to relive just one day. Reluctantly, he allows her to do so, and she is torn by the beauty of the ordinary and by her lack of awareness of it. She cries out to her mother, Mama, just look at me one minute as though you really saw me. It goes so fast. We don't have time to look at one another. And she goes back to the graveyard and the quiet company of others lying there. And she asks for the stage manager. And she asks the stage manager, do any human beings ever realize life while they live it? And he sighs and says, no. The saints and poets, maybe. They do some. Poets and saints. What an odd coupling. And yet Freud, too, puts them together, saying that, they are the two classes of human, human beings who defy all his psychological categorizing, who are full of surprises. Are we willing and able to be surprised? If we are to be aware of life while we are living it, we must have the courage to relinquish our hard-earned control of ourselves because our reflexes have been conditioned as thoroughly as those of Pavlov's dog. This is never easy. But reflexes can be unlearned and reconditioned. When my husband was on Broadway, we were night people, going to bed in the small hours of the morning and sleeping late. Now that he was on daytime television shows, we have to recondition our reflexes to become morning people, getting up early and changing our bedtime too. It wasn't easy, but we made the transition, and now I find it difficult not to wilt around 10 in the morning. Daylight at first can be shocking and painful to the night conditioned. It hurts our eyes, burns the skin. It takes a while to want it. And once we decide we want the light, we must learn to trust it. We are giving hints along the way, our nighttime dreams for one. In our dreams, we are bound by neither time nor space. We move through the ages and all over the world and sometimes beyond. In dreams, we are able to fly, and, oh, and though the Freudian frame of mind would label this as mere sex symbol, I believe that it's far more than that, that it is a remembering of how we are meant to be. I've always enjoyed my dreams and can remember clearly some that go back as far as my eighth or ninth year. I am often someone else in my dreams. I was once, when I was around 11, Elizabethan pirate. I am often not present in my dreams at all, not even as a conscious observer. Sometimes I dream full stories and they are so satisfying as dreams that I seldom have any desire to put them on paper. Only very occasionally does something that comes to me in a dream end up in whatever it is I am currently writing. Thanks so much for stopping by. If you'd like to find more of my work, you can find me on Instagram where all my links are listed under at Robin underscore Norgren or at UBU for life.